You know, one of the things that I learned uh, in doing this job, uh, and I learned it really from the Obama administration when I saw the, the uh, TARP bill that was about that big, um, I remember seeing that and thinking, how, how is this happening? Th th this took months, if not years, to put together. And he had been in office for, I can't remember which bill that was, the bailout, I think, um, the stimulus bailout. And it, I remember thinking, uh, how many people? Conservatives generally don't do that. Do you think that there's a bunch of people? There should be. But do you think there's a bunch of leadership of the conservative movement or the freedom movement that are now meeting and putting together bills so when the Republicans win, they can come in and just put these things in and undo this mess? No, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. And everything that is happening right now is happening by design. Tonight I wanna to show you the rainbow connections. And Kermit the Frog is not involved in this, although he probably gets some money from it. Do you remember when we were arguing back and forth about uh, gay marriage? And I've had the same opinion on gay marriage, I think my whole life. It's no business of the government. It's no business of the government. Anybody should be able to marry whoever they want. There shouldn't be anything that involves the government on that. But we didn't argue that. Um, instead, we got into some weird argument and it ended up that love wins because Americans are compassionate people. But as we were standing here with our children, I know I've said for years, government has no place and you can't base it on this because that will open up a slippery slope. That, how dare you, this is about love. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. For the average person who is gay and wanted marriage, that's what it was about, but not the money. Notice what happened? Then anybody who made a wedding cake, you had to comply. Uh, if you took photographs, if you did flowers, you had to comply. Then the next thing was non-gender bathrooms. And I remember saying, how many people is this affecting at Target all over the country, really? Then it was shout your abortion. Then Caitlyn Jenner, you had to say she was beautiful. Okay, then Non-gender started being talked about in school. It's not just the trans librarian that came somewhere up here. We started saying that there is no gender and that men can have babies. And then there was Leah Thomas. Everybody can be anything and compete. We've lost the difference between men and women. Now we're into serious sex education. I mean, not birds and bees stuff, I mean actually Toys that should be nowhere around kids, K through 12. The only thing left now is man boy love. Or what are they calling it? Adult child uh, attraction? That's coming. It's not about love. It is, and it always has been, about infanticide, abortion on demand at any time, no gender because that kills the traditional family, it kills the parents, and in the end, the target is the Western culture. I'm gonna show you how this has all been funded. Next. Hello, America. Tonight, we are in the middle of one of the key cultural battles of our time. It's not even a battle, this is war because there's only going to be one side left standing. It is important to understand what we're up against. Recently, I saw an article written by a mom of a teenage daughter titled Trans, a Dangerous Youth Subculture. Now this mom says, quote, my teenage daughter has decided that she is trans. So have all of her friends. Not some of them, not most of them, every single one. Now this mom, you would think, who's writing this, is probably from the Bible Belt. No, she describes herself as politically liberal and says her daughter had never even heard of the word trans until she moved to, quote, a new, cool, trans-friendly school. So here we have adults steering kids down a dangerous path, which involves 
permanent life-altering drugs and surgeries for which there is no good evidence base. The adults are not just missing in action on this one, they are the driving force behind the damage, end quote. She says, I don't know how, quite we, how we quite got here, but this needs to stop, end quote. I think that's what a lot of Americans are wondering. How did we get here? And many not be, may not be aware of just how serious an issue the attack on gender really is. The transgender movement overall is an assault on the very foundation of not only civilization, but life itself. Male and female coming together, having babies, that is the basic building block of the entire universe. This movement ultimately seeks to destroy that reality. Now, someone is gonna watch this show and I can guarantee they will accuse me of lacking compassion for transgender people. We have to get over people's feelings, mine or yours, and listen to what we're talking about. I'm not talking about individuals and I'm not being dismissive of gender dysphoria. It's something that I don't personally understand because I've never experienced it in my life or with anybody that I know. But I am aware enough and, and empathetic enough to see, my gosh, I can't imagine being in that position. I understand it can be painful and it is a very complicated struggle. But can we pull back and look culturally at what is happening? We're now at the point when even questioning transgenderism is off limits, even and especially if it involves children. That speaks volumes about the power of this movement and the power brokers who are driving it. And that brings up another thing about this movement. It is anti-freedom, period. Increasingly, this is not a live and let live situation. From media to sports to education to government, everything. This movement is working to shoehorn acceptance of whatever it believes and whatever it says today into every corner of society. But along with that is the massive effort to muzzle anyone who opposes or questions for discrimination purposes. The internal organizations and the organizations here in the country and externally, international, local school boards, that grip is getting tighter and tighter every day. In theory, after the 2015 Supreme Court decision legalizing gay marriage, shouldn't we have seen things? This is what the goal was. Everything else, slippery slope, that's crazy. You would expect that there would have been a celebration and a wind down of LGBT activism. But there wasn't. That decision was a major landmark, but it was not the end goal of the movement. Again, separate people from the movement and the money. Over the last seven years since the decision, the goalposts keep moving with a noticeable increased focus on transgenderism. Now, why are the goalposts being moved like that? Well, it's a combination of a couple of things. First, gender ideology. Gender ideology is not new. We just haven't paid attention to it. It has been growing in the petri dish of academia for decades, and it grew right out of Marxism, radical feminism, and the gay liberation movement. Its goal is dismantling the nuclear family altering or silencing religious belief, mainly Christianity, and eliminating the outdated distinctions of male and female. Now, yes, I'm an old, but when did that become outdated universally? When did male and female suddenly go out of fashion? Did it happen in the animal kingdom? Attorney Mary Rice Hassan, She's from the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She's an expert on the dangers of gender ideology, and she describes the movement as working towards a utopia where, quote, 
every individual from childhood on would be free to self-identify beyond the male-female binary and free to engage in consensual sexual activity unrestricted by sex, gender, number of persons, marital status, or even age, quote, post-puberty. <laughs> that line will be deleted soon, I'm sure. The second factor that has moved the goalposts for the LGBT movement is money. Gender ideology would not get anywhere without massively deep pockets. And those deep pockets require a constant re-upping of the stakes to motivate the fundraising. So just six months after Obergefell versus Hodges' decision, several prominent nonprofits announced a five-year initiative and $20 million in donations to promote and support the next step, transgenderism. During the first year after the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage, overall funding for transgender issues reached a record high of $16.8 million, increasing 22% over the previous year. Leading the charge for that five-year $20 million initiative was the Arcus Foundation. Now, I've got a, a chalkboard and everything else coming, so just keep track as much as you can. The Arcus Foundation pledged $15 million for transgender causes. Arcus was started in the year 2000 by a guy named John Stryker. He's one of the deepest pockets in this movement. He's heir to the Stryker Corporation Fortune, a medical supply company based in Michigan. Arcus is now the largest funder of LGBT causes in the U.S. and one of the largest in the world. One of the Arcus Foundation's many sponsorships is a group called Outright Action International. Now, it organized the first global transgender conference in 2010. From that effort, Outright became the only LGBT organization with, quote, consultative uh, status and permanent presence at the United Nations headquarters. Oh, good. So they're consulting. This is great. At the UN, Outright says, quote, it acts as a watchdog on all 193 world governments. Did you hire them to be the police? Even more curious is Outright's partnership with a project with the World Economic Forum's Center for New Economy and Society. Just a creepy way of saying Great Reset, I think. Okay, so the goal of the collaboration is to pressure companies to commit to the United Nations Standard of Conduct for Business. Now, these standards for business include establishing, and I quote, mechanisms to monitor and communicate about their compliance with human rights standards. And businesses must engage in, quote, public advocacy for LGBT causes, including challenging abusive government actions, end quote. Is the Disney thing making sense? This is why the Walt Disney Corporation, for example, has been challenging Florida's parental rights in education bill. Another one of the largest LGBT profits, uh, nonprofits in the United States is the Gill Foundation. It was started by left-wing megadonor Tim Gill. Since the mid-1990s, Gill has spent over $360 million advancing the LGBT agenda. Right after gay marriage was legalized in 2015, Gill said, let's set up the slip and slide. Gill vowed to continue legal fights all over the U.S., saying, quote, We're going into the hardest states in the country. We're going to, and I'm quoting, punish the wicked. There is no sense in which the job is ever done. Oh, my gosh. So we have a grand inquisitor now. In 2019, he did an interview with Gill's husband, Scott Miller. He said, quote, we're actually really quiet people, but excuse the language. If you F around with the LGBT community, you will face Tim Gill's wrath. Again, did you hire him to be a police officer to watch your thoughts, monitor your thoughts, uh, oversee the things that your business impact your life at all? Because I didn't. I didn't vote for him. 
Partygill's effort is to, quote, punish the wicked, and its uh, funding is coming along with his close friend, John Stryker. And it is something they've set up together called the Proteus Fund. The Proteus Fund fights against religious exe uh, exemptions related to both LGBT issues and abortion. Do you remember the case? Jack Phillips, the masterpiece cake shop uh, baker from Colorado? Yeah, that was Proteus. They helped fund both the ACLU, EU, which took the case, the lead in the case, against Phillips, and they funded another legal group that filed an abacus brief with the Supreme Court in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. One guy, two guys, sorry, two guys. They got it done. Now, this is the classy side note. Proteus also funds the Southern Poverty Law Center, which still designates the conservative legal group that defunded Jack Phillips as a hate group. Proteus Fund uh, embodies Tim Gill's Punish the Wicked mission in all of its devotion to fighting all religious exemptions. In fact, let's go to 2016. Proteus launched the Rights, Faith, and Democracy Collaborative to fight against religious exemptions at the state level. Proteus claims that, quote, the rights of millions are being systematically eviscerated under the false pretense of protecting religious freedom, end quote. At the same time, they work to influence religious groups from within, funding dissident groups like Catholics for Choice. You don't have to dig very far to find out what Catholics for Choice are all about. Their president, Jamie Manson, said, quote, women and other marginalized genders are suffering at the hands of the Catholic hierarchy, the most radical patriarchy in the world. No, no, no. There you go, Osama bin Laden would, maybe if he were alive, have an argument there. Anyway, um, but th in that comment is the key, other genders. These massive influence campaigns are making an impact. Just last week, Politico reported that the Biden administration is in the process now of ending a Trump administration rule that allowed medical workers to refuse to provide private services or I mean, commercial services when they were in conflict with their religious or moral views. Now, here's a joke. I mean, Trump, that rule never was even implemented because it got choked up in court after court after court because all these advocacy groups started rising up. That's how ruthless the transgender and abortion, abortion movement really are. They target the minority of conscientious objectors when they could easily get these desired services somewhere else. They will not let people just live and be. Okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to tell you about a mega, a mega group of mega donors and the activists uh, called the Cabinet. Next. Okay, let me tell you about Relief Factor. If you're one of the millions of Americans um, who suffer every day from pain, I want you to listen up. There is hope, and it comes in the form of Relief Factor. And every single day, I see testimonies of people who have tried Relief Factor for their pain and gotten their life back. It can happen. I know it happens because it happened to me, and I didn't believe these commercials. I really didn't. Um, I never, they were advertisers on the Blaze for a long time, always asked me, and I wouldn't even try it. I was like, it's not going to work for me. Um, and my wife finally was like, you're going to try it because you've tried everything else. And I'm like, it's not going to work. Well, I'm not going to listen to you whine unless you try it. Okay. So I tried it. I took it for three weeks, and I didn't think it was working, and then I stopped. I said to my wife, this isn't working. And I stopped and I went, oh my gosh, yeah, it is. Now, I, I don't have any of that pain. Rarely do I have the pain like I used to. And uh, that's all coming from Relief Factor. Please try it. Just try it for three weeks. If it's not working for you in three weeks, probably not going to. Try the uh, three-week quick start. 70% of the people who try it go on to order more month after month. 1995, go to relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. All right, you ready to go to the chalkboard? Before the break, I told you about John Stryker and Tim Gill. Remember, Tim Gill and John Stryker. 
And Tim Gill, whose foundation has spent hundreds of millions of dollars advancing the LGBT agenda, promoting transgenderism. Both of them do it, but I want to focus on Tim here for a second. You know, I put up here, money doesn't talk, it screams. How many people really are behind teaching our kids that there is no gender? How's that happening? A country of 350 million people, and now this is being jammed down our throat and our kids' throat? How many people? It's not the people. I'll show you. It's a very small handful of people. It's the money that is doing it. Tim Gill almost single-handedly is responsible for funding the litigation behind every major LGBT court victory in the last 20 years, including the court case on gay marriage. The attorney, uh, the attorney in that case said, quote, without a doubt, we would not be where we are without Tim Gill and the Gill Foundation. Now, I mentioned this not as a slam on gay marriage. If you're familiar with the show, you know my position. Why am I even saying this? The government has no place in our business, period. I'm pointing this out because the LGBT agenda, especially transgenderism in recent years, is portrayed as this organic kind of evolution of society. Essentially, society's just waking up to this. We're embracing the new possibilities of being human. That is not what is happening. What is happening is the result of a multi-year, multi-million dollar marketing campaign bankrolled by a group of very wealthy activists, people who don't naturally gravitate towards a certain kind of cereal, you know? It has to be marketed to them as good, good for them. In some ways, they've got to say that, even if it's not good for them. Well, John Stryker and Tim Gill are pioneers in this marketing project. You know, what is the old uh, line from uh, South Pacific? You have to be carefully taught to hate. That is exactly what's happening. But there are others who are part of the massive money network known as, believe it or not, I mean, if this doesn't sound scary as heck, the cabinet. Now that includes a couple of people. Um, this guy, David Bennett, he is a tech millionaire and also Jonathan Lewis. You may not know him, but he's the family that started Progressive Insurance. Yep, that's what they really mean, Progressive Insurance. These are the people that are funding all of it. The cabinet. Now, around 2005, the cabinet started pulling, pouring millions of dollars into state legislative races, targeting politicians they perceived to be anti-gay. A Time Magazine report said, among gay activists, the cabinet is revered as kind of a super secret gay super friends, a homosexual justice league that can quietly swoop in wherever anti-gay candidates are threatening and finance victories for the good guys. Depends on how you define good guys. The cabinet has been extremely organized and efficient and quiet in their political activism. In 2006, it created and funded uh, the movement called MAP. I like this. MAP. Movement Advancement Project, which tracks LGBT organizations to ensure they're running efficiently and staying on message. One activist described MAP as the gay IRS. There is an exception to MAP's oversight, however. It doesn't monitor the nonprofits run by any of the individuals seen here in the cabinet. Members of the cabinet and always operating in lockstep, shall we say. Now, Jonathan Lewis used to be on the board uh, of Media Matters. You know, that's a progressive insurance guy. Uh, and he was uh, also with Democracy Alliance. But he got frustrated with the lack of passion for gay rights. What are you kidding me? In Media Matters and Democracy Alliance, started by George Soros, they love the gays, right? Apparently, not so much. He doesn't think so, at least. He said there wasn't enough enthusiasm. So he 
left these organizations, both Media Matters, the board, and Democracy Alliance. Now, his father was a founding member of Democracy Alliance, along with Tim Gill and George Soros. It's one giant, happy, dark money family. Now, Jonathan Lewis, he told the, uh, uh, Jonathan Lewis is a political advisor, and he told Politico, quote, for many years, we tried to get people elected and play nicely within the system. Still nothing was happening. So we undertook to create such an S-storm that something would have to happen. That S-storm included funding a group called Get Equal, which protested the don't ask, don't tell policy by having gay veterans handcuff themselves to the White House fence. Another member of the cabinet, David Bonnet, uh, was given over $25 million to LGBT activist groups since he started his foundation in 1999. Now, according to Capital Research Center, Bonnet's foundation pushes for LGBT youth to come out at an earlier age. And they support that goal by funding LGBT youth centers throughout the U.S. As a part of that effort to influence youth, earlier this year, Bonnet gave a grant to a group called Gender Nation, which does this. Gender Nation buys LGBTQ affirming books that celebrate all kids just the way they are and donates those books to public school libraries. The nonprofit Gender Nation is thrilled to be making their largest donation yet. Gender Nation donated the books. Gender Nation donated 2,000 age appropriate LGBTQ books. Every school, no matter where it is, is a better, safer, more inclusive place with these books on the shelf. Yeah. LGBT, LGB, T, trans, queer, two, that's the two spirit thing, right? Plus, I don't even know what that one is. Really? If you're one of the many parents scratching their heads wondering how trans suddenly entered your child's vocabulary in the last couple of years, it's because of multiple efforts like this one funded by members of the cabinet called the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. This is the organization that believes every student has the right to a safe, supportive, I agree, LGBTQ inclusive K through 12 education. I don't want my kindergartners knowing any of this stuff. I don't even want them to identify as straight. Leave them alone. The GLSEN Respect Awards are coming up in a few weeks where the Corporate Ally Award will be given to Nickelodeon for its contribution to the transgender mass marketing effort with ads like this one. In honor of International Transgender Day of Visibility, meet Time and Nickelodeon's 2021 Kid of the Year finalist, Rebecca Brusehoff. Growing up in the LGBTQ plus community has given me a different perspective on how I see the world. Trans kids are so much more than their gender okay. identity and it's- All right. Last week, a middle school in San Marcos, Texas, hosted Queer Week. Queer Week, in which students in sixth through eighth grade got to dress in rainbow colors on Pride Day, wear name tags with their pronouns and their preferred names on Pronoun Day. The school's principal emailed parents that, quote, the goal of the week is to provide a school culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. There it is, the three magic Marxist words. Klaus Schwab would be so proud. The Queer Week events were supposedly voluntary, but even so, the school is flirting with violation of the sex education opt-out requirements for parents in Texas. The final event of the week last Friday was a National Day of Silence, where students are supposed to go through the whole school day without speaking to protest LGBT discrimination. Hmm. Wonder where they got that idea. The National Day of Silence is a project of GLSEN. One study last year found nearly 10% of high school students identify as gender diverse. 
Just two months ago, a Gallup poll found the LGBT percentage of the total U.S. population had doubled to 7.1% in the last decade. The poll finds 21% of Gen Z identifying as either gay or transgender. Guys, we are animals. We're animals. It doesn't happen in these numbers in nature. There is something else happening. Dr. Deborah So blames the sharp rise on trendiness. Assuming she's correct, what could cause such a trend? Now, I am a doctor, but I am no social scientist. And after the massive money and marketing effort I've just showed you so far tonight, I would say it's probably not a coincidence that those numbers have shot up over the last few years. Back in a minute with the campaign that practically invented the ESG score. Uh, I have a uh, ranch and I, I raise cattle uh, and it's not a big operation. I just live in a small town of about 500 people and um, I see these farmers every day, these ranchers every day, and I don't know how they make it. I really don't. I mean, you want to make a million dollars? Good. Become a rancher or a farmer and start with 10 million. A couple of years, you'll have that whittled down to a million easy. Um, this, this is why I'm so passionate about good ranchers. You know, getting good meat, we all want the best meat at the best price. But we also, I think, would like to stop it coming from overseas. Prices are up near 20% to get 100% U.S. beef, U.S. chicken, fish. That's hard. That's hard. Not with good ranchers. I want you to go to goodranchers.com slash Glenn right now. Do a one-time order, or you can subscribe and save an additional $25 off each box. Now listen, when you subscribe, your price will never go up for the life of your subscription. You can't lock the, store, uh, the grocery store into prices and deals like that. You can't. Inflation-proof your meals right now with Good Ranchers. I don't know how long they're going to make this offer. Do it now. GoodRanchers.com. She wants to go to school, have fun with her friends, and play sports just like anybody else. Sports are something that I really like doing. I'm so much more than trans. That doesn't make me less of a girl. It doesn't make me less of a human either. I'm just me. All right, so if Rebecca looks familiar at all, it is because she's the same trans girl from Nickelodeon and that ad I showed you earlier. Here she is being used again in propaganda from the Human Rights Campaign, which is the largest LGBT activist organization in the U.S. and a major player in far-left politics. Earlier this month, the Human Rights Campaign also partnered with Warner Media on a video called Let Us Play, which again focuses on normalizing transgenderism among children. Transgender kids want to play too. Let us play. Hey, this is like love wins. We cannot abandon children. You can't even, a doctor can't say, hey, let's see if there's something else. I want you to talk to this psychologist. You can't. They must prescribe drugs. This is very dangerous. Like I said before the break, this is a massive marketing campaign that requires a lot of players and payers. The human rights campaign receives funding from the usual suspects of the left, left wing dark money, George Soros, Planned Parenthood, and the National Education Association Teachers Union. Huh. The NEA has official partnerships with the human rights campaign. And GLSEN, the group I told you about earlier, just another reason why, why transgender promotion is more and more prominent in public schools, huh? And of course, the human rights campaign has a ton of corporate sponsors. Gee, look at, hey, Coca-Cola, Pfizer, huh? 
Amazon, Apple, American Airlines, who would have guessed? Okay, the human rights campaign has been around since 1980, supposedly battling to end LGBT discrimination. However, uh, HRC has had little success getting laws passed. In fact, on the human rights campaign past victories page, it, it lists one win. It's 42 years old. One. The 2009 Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Most of its victories have come through court decisions, ballot initiatives, and executive actions. You know, the preferred way for progressives to get what they want. During President Obama's first year in office, members of the Human Rights Campaign leadership logged 88 visits to the White House. Then, in 2012, the Human Rights Commission president at the time became co-chair of Obama's re-election campaign. Laying that kind of groundwork has already paid off with the Biden administration. During President Biden's first week in office, he signed an executive order declaring his support for boys participating as girls in girls sports. Quote, children should be able to learn without worrying about whether they'll be denied, denied access to the restroom, the locker room or school sports. In a separate order, Biden changed U.S. policy to allow transgendered individuals serving in the military to, quote, uh, transition gender while serving. Six months later, Biden issued another executive order that government agencies must provide, quote, supportive services for transgender and gender nonconforming non-binary employees who wish to legally, medically, or socially transition. You know, I heard a phrase today that I really like. Uh, it's RAGE. It's an acronym. Um, RAGE. It was uh, release all government employees. I think that's what it was. We should get rid of all of them. All of them. Everyone should be fired. What are we doing? Last month on Transgender Day of Visibility, the Biden administration announced even more actions, including having the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration release new information for providers confirming that, quote, providing gender affirming care is neither child maltreatment nor malpractice. These are government policy changes completely on their own outside of the legislative process. Lack of success in Congress hasn't kept the human rights campaign from battling for the ultimate legislation, the Equality Act. This act will add sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes under federal civil rights law. The Equality Act passed in the House in 2019 and again in 2021, mostly along party lines. During his presidential campaign, Biden promised that getting the Equality Act passed would be his top legislative priority. Guess what event he was speaking at when he made that promise. Yeah, the Human Rights Campaign Annual Gala on the first day of Pride Month. The Equality Act is currently stuck in the Senate waiting to be voted on. If it passes, it would mean no more exemptions based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 93. Faith-based organizations cannot be prosecuted for holding to the federal government's definition of gender. That's what makes the Equality Act so dangerous. It would make your belief, Christian or otherwise, about what it means to be male and fe female essentially illegal. For example, it would basically treat anyone who insisted on a female sports team being made up of biological females only the same as any racist who would deny someone a seat at a restaurant because of skin color. If the Equality Act passes, it will be a coup for gender ideology. Several years before ESG standards became all the rage in the investing world, the Human Rights Campaign was doling out its own scores. Since 2002, the Human Rights Commission has published its Corporate Equality Index, which um, uh, rates U.S. companies on how well they compel or comply with uh, HRC's own standards. 
They have a scoring system that is constantly changing to include more and more demands. For example, in 2018, they demanded that all companies cover all medical necessary care for transgender employees, including sex reassignment surgery. The same year, they also required companies now to require that their contractors also follow all HRC policies. Otherwise, you get points deducted on your corporate equality index score. You know, HRC scoring system is nuts, even when the Daily Beast calls them out for being arbitrary. In 2019, before the House passed the Equality Act the first time, 110 U.S. companies came out in support of the act, and each of them just happened to receive a perfect CEI score that year. It's a giant coincidence, I'm sure. And, of course, HRC's annual scorecard is also used for boycott campaigns against companies like Chick-fil-A that just doesn't measure up to their standards. Since HRC is so successful with its corporate pressure tactics, it also created a healthcare equality index to rate hospitals and municipal equality index to rate city governments. Things were going great for Johns Hopkins, the hospital in Baltimore. They had top score for years until 2016, when two researchers from the hospital published a paper daring to criticize the accepted views of transgender health and gender identity. As a result, Johns Hopkins got punished in their next rating. Um, yeah, the HRC made up a new rule so it could give John Hopkins a 25-point deduction for the crime of having, and I quote, a large-scale official or public anti-LGBTQ blemish on their recent records. Tim Gill is not the only one playing the punish the wicked game. It's intense, it's widespread, and it is extremely well-funded. The entire movement is not simply about protecting rights, as they claim. It is about destroying rights. It is about silencing any dissent and forced acceptance of a single narrative that has nothing to do with transgenderism, has everything to do with the destruction of the family and the West. It'd be tragic enough if the debate was confined to adults, but children are their major focus and target of this propaganda. I want you to look back at the uh, council's Let Us Play video. It's now running on all Warner media outlets. It's just kids wanting to play. What kind of monster do you have to be? You want that kid not to play? The focus is on innocence and joy. Unless it involves sex, then the same people say children are not innocent. If they want to have sex with an adult, they can. But when it comes to this one, just like the first at the top of the slippery slope, it was about love. This is too. There is no honesty about the medical debate. Never mind any questions about mental health. And of course, there's no hint of the unfairness of someone like Leah uh, Thomas dominating in women's sports. If she's going to participate, why would your daughter? After the break, I want to take a, clo a closer look at who's driving the transgender ideology right directly into our schools. Stand by. I think you know me. I'm pretty skeptical by nature. So when I first heard about a home title theft, I'm like, really? Really? Some cyber criminal is going to forge my name on my title and uh, take over as the owner of my house? No. And I even told uh, Pat and Stu at the time, he'll never get mine because I have protected it six ways to Sunday. My name's not on it, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, no. No. In fact, the FBI agent that came to talk to me about it, he showed me the paperwork he did and how easy it was. And he said, actually, yours was the easiest to forge. Huh? Thank you for that. So home title lock, protect your home's equity and your title for pennies a day. What happens is somebody steals your title, they just transfer it, they fill out some stupid forms, send them in, the bank thinks that that now is your house, you, they can go in for a loan for the equity in your house, they rob you blind, you don't know for maybe a year or so. 
Go to HomeTitleLock.com right now. Read the testimonials from FBI agents and government officials. Number two, register to your home to see if you're already a victim and you don't even know it. HomeTitleLock.com. Do it now. HomeTitleLock.com. Jodie Foster is a woman, and she made me question my sexuality when I was a child because I liked her so much. Oh. And she was nude in the film Nell. Not that I remember watching it several times as a child. I mean, everybody should aspire to grow up and be a gay icon. And that's oh. what Pride Day is all about. You're right. See you at Pride, everybody. Oh, I'm just so sick of this. I don't want my child watching this in third grade, especially without my knowledge, okay? That's what happened in a school in Glendale, California just last year. It happened while the school was still doing distant learning. So one parent heard the video over Zoom. It was like, what? Get offline. What are you doing? The parent contacted the teacher asking uh, to let them know when you're done teaching sexu sexu sexual orientation so she could let her kid back in on Zoom. Uh, teacher emailed her administrators letting them know what happened and she was uh, she was now afraid to do two more days of the Pride Month lessons that she had planned. Her administrators replied with, quote, do not be concerned or afraid. Thanks for your bravery. One of them even pointed toward further resources she could use from GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. I told you about that earlier tonight. This is where we are now. Sexual instruction and gender ideology is part of the school curriculum in most parts of the U.S., and there is much more coming down the pike. In addition to GLSEN, one of the biggest promoters of sexual and transgenderism in school is the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the U.S., their goal is none less than, quote, building a movement of voters laser focused on progressing and advancing progressive sex education and implementation across the country. We believe that comprehensive public sex education can change the world. Our ultimate goal is to bring about a complete transformation of K through 12 public sex education in the United States. They also say sex ed equals social change. So if you care about LGBTQ plus liberation, about ending gender based violence, child abuse, white supremacy, if you want to dance at the revolution, the fight for sex ed is for you. CECAS was started in 1964 by Dr. Mary Calderon. She was a, a medical director at Planned Parenthood at the time. She received startup money from Hugh Hefner's Playboy Foundation. I mean, who doesn't want sex edge curriculum coming from Planned Parenthood and Playboy? I mean, what could go wrong there? So they have an ongoing partnership now with Planned Parenthood and two other groups I've discussed tonight, GLSEN and the Human Rights Campaign. They're overhauling everything. But tomorrow on radio, I'm going to tell you how good old George Soros pepperoni eyes is also involved. And they're coming to your school. Gang, just a few years ago, we were at the top of this slippery slope. We are down here. We are about at normalizing pedophilia, which is the end of everything that we know and love. You're in war. Recognize that. And go get involved in your school now. Your family and your country depend on it. Good night.